it is again on a very common topic um, in office practice and uh, sometimes uh, uh, we are also worried whether to send it to the surgeon or uh, do a uh, barium study or whatever and it is um, the management of uh, functional constipation and it is uh, going to be done by our own pediatric gastroenterologist dr prashant over to prashant Prashant, please unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yes, 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 you are audible. Very good evening to all of my teachers. Prashant, please, please increase the volume. Volume, volume, volume. Yes, sir. Hello. Am I audible now? Yes, 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 yes. And your slides are also perfect. It's clear. It is clear now. Clear now. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, it was actually uh, uh, it was actually a nostalgic feel for me listening to Kalpana Madam after a long time. Uh, after that uh, excellent talk, we will have a discussion on another mundane topic, management of functional constipation in children. I have uh, tried to deal the topic in an unconventional way. We will try to identify some fallacies in the management of functional constipation in children. Slide, sir, sir, slide change. Slide change, slide change. Order, please. Is it clear now? Is it clear now? Hello? Hello? Louder, louder, please. You are clearly audible, but if you can increase the volume, that will be very helpful. Volume, 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 volume. Hello? Yes, yes, Is please continue. Is it clear now? Yes, yes. It, ah, okay. Uh, at the very beginning, I would like to say that this is a very common healthcare problem in office practice. Uh, it's not only a problem for the uh, uh, caregivers, but also for the parents also. This is a very prevalent problem. It is seen to the tune of, uh, it has a wide range from as low as 0.3 percentage to more, more than 30 percentage. And uh, in pediatric practice, in uh, office practice, it accounts for around 3 percentage of uh, uh, children attending the OP practice. And in subspecialty OP, it, uh, it, uh, uh, the figure reaches around 30 percentage. The etiology of this condition is multifactorial. And the key in the management of uh, functional constipation is to break the chain of stool withholding, which is the key issue in functional constipation. And the management involves several modalities, non-pharmacologic inter interventions, pharmacologic interventions, and other alternatives. As on 2020, the uh, pathophysiology of functional constipation in children, this is what we know as on 2020, it has some connection with behavioral disorders, there is some psychological connection. There is some connection linked to the lifestyle factors like diet, fluid intake, obesity, and, physic and physical activity. And on the other hand, stress and uh, stressful, uh, stressful life events are also contributory to the development of functional constipation. The, par the parental factors like depression and over overprotection also contributing. Then there are some recent advances in the form of uh, understanding coming from the microbiome based studies, genetic factors, colonialist mortality, and impaired anorectal function contributing to the pathogenesis of functional constipation in children. We will uh, uh, try to navigate the topic by 
listening to a case signet you have a 3 year old toddler girl who has come with history of chronic abdominal pain for the last 10 months and uh, for the same complaint she has received a proton pump inhibitors probiotics anti spasmodics and short course of multiple laxatives intermittently during this 10 month period and at times she has received a rectal suppositories she was twice for the problem she apparently has no red flag symptoms as, uh, as specific to this uh, uh, chronic abdominal pain extensive investigations were done all normal finally the baby was advised to reduce milk intake and increase green leafy vegetable cons- uh, consumption the parents are very much frustrated and worried then in the revisiting the history of this child as apparent from the previous slide the child has been having abdominal pain for the last 10 months the, the pain is relatively confined to the peri umbilical and left lower quadrant uh, in location and it is so freaking tight and the bowel habits were asked specifically she was giving history of passing passing hard pellets to and there no entry of uh, any pia or any toothless in that sense and the uh, toilet training was inquired into when she was having she was she was uh, put to rigorous training from one year of age onwards and uh, the mother reported that at time the baby adopts bizarre posture when asked for defecation there was also history of vomiting after feeds the history of leaky stools and fecal soiling occasionally this girl is fond of dairy products and chocolates and you can see in the picture you can see in the uh, slide this was the picture brought by the mother when she came for uh, our came, came to our op that uh, when the baby is called for defecation she will hold on to the furniture she will adopt a criss cross to posture by the crossed legs and she will uh, position herself as if trying to defecate this is actually the uh, ret- the stool retention posture classically seen in functional constipation in fact the child is not trying to defecate by adopting this posture but the child is actually trying to hold the fecal matter from being expelled they proceeded with the physical examination there was fecal lump in the left lower quadrant the uh, there was uh, the anus was properly placed the rectal examination is not tender back and fecal soiling and dry sausage shaped stools this is very much suggestive of fecal retention the anal wing and cremastic reflex were examined all were normal basically the examination was just to rule out any other anomalies or any other systemic neurologic problems etc so the final diagnosis is here the child was having chronic abdominal pain with the functional constipation being unmasked and now the child has presented with a fecal infection this brings to us some pertinent issues with regard to this case is the is there a, is there a difficulty in arriving at a definitive diagnosis are are investigations really essential to label this as functional constipation how early should toilet training be started what is the comment regarding dietary manipulations alone as a treatment then uh, not resorting to disimpaction before going on for regular laxatives the comment regarding short course of laxatives one after the other use of other medications especially like the probiotics and antispasmodics in the management of this condition so before going to the topic proper we need to be we need to refresh the basics of the function basics in the pathophysiology of uh, uh, functional constipation it all starts with a painful defecation due to a number of, due to varying factor it may be due to a change in routine especially uh, a child being sent to school not familiar with the uh, routine the day that there is a disruption in the day, uh, daily routine so much so that she finds it difficult to spare time for defecation in the morning changes in the diet especially some new food items etc is being introduced especially in the case of a breastfeeding baby starting on complementary feed some stressful events happening in the family too early toilet training have as happened in this case all this will be per, will be uh, pushing the child into 
cycle of painful defecation resulting in voluntary withholding. The consequence of this voluntary withholding will be that, that the stool will be retained in the rectal ampulla for a long time that will result in absorption of fluids, further increase in size and consistency of the stool okay. makes it harder. The, con the, the consequence of this process will be there will be dysenergic defecation that is during the normal uh, defecatory process what is expected is that the puborectalis muscle is expected to relax the internal anal sphincter and external anal sphincter all these are expected to relax during the defecatory process that is not happening so there is incomplete evacuation of fecus there will be fecal impaction after fecal impaction there will be seepage of uh, contained fecal matter in the form of fecal incontinence and this will be causing considerable difficulty so the basic process is voluntary withholding until and otherwise this chain is broken this problem is bound to recur so the, the fallacy number one making diagnosis of functional constipation are we missing diagnosing a child with the functional constipation is clinical examination alone is sufficient or do we need elaborate investigations to reach a definitive diagnosis how to how to identify children presenting with chronic constipation in simpler terms, constipation can be defined as difficulty and delay in passing stool resulting in significant distress. If the symptoms are of less than two weeks duration, we label it as acute and more than two weeks, we label it as chronic. And uh, having said that, there is a lack of objectivity in the definition. We, send, we, we are mainly talking about the number of bowel movements. We are not concentrating on the other aspects like consistency and the other accompanying features, etc. To dispel this confusion, as in other functional GI disorders, just like that, the ROM, right, the, the ROM Foundation has, propo has proposed a set of uh, very, uh, very useful diagnostic criteria based on which we can arrive at a diagnosis. And, uh, and uh, of, of very recently, we have our Indian set of criteria developed by the Indian Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology in 2018, and this has been published in the Indian Pediatrics. According to the according to the guidelines, they have defined the the, the 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 symptom of constipation should last for more than four weeks across all the age groups. Along with that, there should be any two of this. There should be the defecatory frequency that should be less than or equal to two times per week, and there should be history of fecal incontinence more than one time per week after the acquisition of toileting skills is around two to three years of age then there is history of stool retention as in, as as uh, as we saw in the case the child adopting retentive posture history of painful or hard bowel movements presence of large mass in the rectum or on parabdominal para examination this we have seen in, the, in our case as well and history of large stools that may obstruct the toilet the last one may not be relevant to our criteria if we harp on just the frequency alone, that may, that may not be rewarding to pick up cases with the constipation. So we need to concentrate on other factors like consistency, straining, stool retention, then mass on palpation, that is suggestive of fecal impaction. All these are required if we want to make a conclusive diagnosis. To give objectivity to identify the consistency of stool, there are some valuable tools like the one such tool is the modified Bristol stool chart. This has given uh, classification depending upon the consistency of the stool uh, starting from type 1 to type 7. The type 1 is the classical hard lumpy stools which are difficult to pass. If we, if we use the tools like this it will add more objectivity in identifying the problem. Of late there is a recent, stu uh, recent uh, tool which gives objectivity that is the Brussels infant and toddler stool, tool, stool scale. These have not been validated in Indian children. Apart from the classical symptoms which I have mentioned, we should be also on the lookout for a non-specific abdominal pain because uh, uh, around 30%, around 30 to 50 30 percentage of uh, chronic abdominal pain who present to our office practice they will be actually having chronic constipation as the contributory factor and because the fecal incontinence they can have urinary symptoms like urinary frequency, hesitancy, incontinence etc. due to the fecal mass compressing over the bladder then as a consequence of fecal impaction they can have fecal incontinence 
and due to the long standing uh, constipation constipatory symptoms they can have blood streak during defecation resulting from an anal fissure at times this can be with a painful uh, defecation also along with the blood in stools then uh, this non specific abdominal pain can masquerade in the form of school absenteeism also and very rarely as shown in the picture they can develop what is called as uh, the solitary rectal ulcer they can present with a profuse bleeding if we if we if we ask the history there will be background history of long standing constipation so how do you differentiate between functional and organic causes by organic the most important condition that we should not miss is the hirschsprung's disease so taking that as a, that as a prototype uh, try to classify the clinical features of functional versus organic we will start from birth history onwards if there is history of delayed passage of meconium if you ask that history that will not be there in functional constipation whereas that is common to the tune of 50 percentage in the case of hirschsprung's disease that is the passage of meconium beyond 48 hours after birth age of onset if we take in functional constipation it is usually after the first two years of age whereas in hirschsprung's disease it is common after infancy that is in very early infancy in the neonatal early neonatal period itself fecal incontinence is very common in functional constipation whereas it is rare in organic reasons like hirschsprung's disease anal fissure due to the long standing problem that is quite common in functional constipation whereas it is rare in organ uh, organic causes like hd failure to thrive will be is a rather uncommon in functional constipation whereas it is possible in organic causes like hirschsprung's disease and abdomen on a coming to the examination point abdominal distension is a rare finding in uh, functional constipation whereas it is a fairly common finding in uh, organic causes like hd uh, moving to the rectal examination there will be fecal staining in case of functional constipation whereas in uh, organic conditions like hirschsprung's disease the rectal examination will reveal an empty rectum with a gush of air having said that there are some red flags in the history and examination which we should uh, pay attention to as already mentioned constipation starting extremely early in life that is uh, well be within the first uh, month of life itself the onset is seen definitely we are dealing with something organic rather than functional then absence of the withholding maneuvers as mentioned in the case vignette delayed passage of meconium this we can get in conditions like hirschsprung's disease and also in cystic fibrosis failure to thrive and anemia this constellation of some other causes like celiac disease etc bilious vomiting abdominal distension all these should point to intestinal of then abnormal neurological findings like the absence of the reflexes uh, tuft of hair etc all these should be a pointer towards neurological problems develop and delay similarly then having said that in the clinical examination do all cases require digital rectal examination it is indicated in those cases where we have the red flag symptoms or signs because in hd and all the findings can be contributory to tailor the investigation onset less than 6 months of age non responders despite good compliance to therapy that is you have instituted treatment and uh, there is no compliance issue but uh, the response is quite bad then in those cases which are presenting with fecal incontinence alone there you need to distinguish whether it is a constipation related or a non retentive incontinence because the management is actually different for both entities and as a routine do we need abdominal x ray like this because being small babies and children should be sensitive to radiological exposure and all in this case in the case vignette which we discussed the the physical examination was contrary was actually pointing to physical uh, this uh, presence of fecal impaction so there are a few settings where you really require x ray as a routine there is a form no for abdominal x ray to diagnose functional constipation but it may be useful in those situation where fecal impaction is sus suspected but in whom physical examination is unreliable or the child is hostile for digital rectal examination that is not possible and all probably it is it may be done then regarding other investigations like 
ordering for barium minima, especially in the setting where you find that uh, the early onset, etc., then not responding properly, complaints. Are we justifying it in ordering for a barium enema as a diagno as a diagnostic modality for uh, making diagnosis of organic thing and all? The problem here is that even in uh, functional cases, you see the picture on the left side of the slide. This is actually uh, a barium enema in a case of uh, functional constipation. Here, what you are seeing is a retained barium in the rectum after 48 hours. This should not be misconstrued as uh, uh, organic cause but this is a very common finding it can be highly fallacious and erroneously reported as uh, uh, this thing uh, Ashman's disease on the right hand panel what you see is the uh, typical finding in a Ashman's disease where you see the, the paradoxical dilatation of the rectum in contradistinction to uh, sigmoid pollen with a transition zone then uh, regarding lab investigation are we really justified in ordering investigations for children presenting with functional constipation laboratory investigation for conditions like hypothyroidism celiac disease hypercalcemia in the setting of uh, uh, constipation is only indicated when the suspicion is uh, so strong for an underlying organic disease otherwise in a in a subset of children presenting with constipation the prevalence of this set condition is not that high in comparison to the general population so as a routine it is not really required so to conclude meticulous clinical history and complete physical examination including digital rectal in examination when indicated as in the scenario mentioned earlier are fairly sufficient to diagnose 95 percentage of cases 95 percentage of the cases uh, to it is sufficient to label clinical examination and history are sufficient to make a diagnosis of functional constipation then regarding fallacy number two Adopting a wait and watch policy to treating childhood constipation, what will be the outcome like? There was a study which study uh, study uh, an, an OP based study where they have observed that children who had constipation for less than three months before presentation to the outpatient clinic, they achieved earlier success than children who had constipation for more than three months before presentation. That is, delaying the presentation, delaying the treatment. Uh, by adopting a wait and watch policy that is actually uh, uh, resulting in unfavorable outcome. At, at six months follow up, they observed that 79% of the children who presented after less than three months were successfully defecating without using laxative, whereas the corresponding figures, children who presented after three months, the figures were only 32%. Percentage. So, so uh, adopting a wait and watch approach that is not fair because if you do that as a consequence of a repeated painful defecation, accumulation of feces in the rectum, the ch children may develop stool withholding behavior which will be perpetuating the problem. That without breaking this chain, the, the cycle will be propagating. And fallacy number three, in the given case, I mentioned that the child was put to toilet training from one year of age. So what is the take on that? So. Culturally, toilet pro training has been given uh, importance from the historic time itself. This is actually a terracotta potty identified from uh, an excavation site in Greece. This dates back to 6th century BC. So that uh, signifies the importance that the culturally how much significance was attached given to this problem. And on the middle panel, you can see an improvised version of a potty found from a 14th century uh, relics identified in France and on the on the right hand side what you see is the modern version of a potty. So we can see that uh, it's more or less the similar, the designs have not much changed. So a few words on toilet training, it should never be attempted before 24 months of age and what is generally advised is the age will be like 3 to 4 years will be ideal for initiation of toilet training. And when we import toilet training, always go by the rule of one. It should be done by a single person, one routine. That is, you can adopt a routine like that after a major, every major meal, the child can be put to toilet and one place and one word to avoid confusion, etc. So this is basically the rule of one. So in practice, what you can do, you can have a scheduled toilet sit for children 
that is two to three times a day for five to ten minutes after the meals within 30 minutes of meal intake this is to make use of the gastropolic reflex so this is how toilet training can be done in practice and if there is a uh, anal fissures are there that has to be treated to ensure painless defecation you can give some lignocaine like jelly etc to ameliorate the symptom then regarding the uh, position that has to be adopted in toilet sitting in sitting in a squatting position that is ideal to maintain the normal angle to facilitate the defecatory process which i which i alluded to earlier the piborectalis muscle the internal anal sphincter external anal sphincter all those things in a normal state the rectum and sigmoid colon that will be in an acute angle and this acute angle has to be obliterated during the process of defecation to make it uh, straight and all and uh, that is actually attained by adopting a squatting position and if you are using a an european toilet you can uh, compensate for the uh, positional disadvantage by providing a foot trust as shown in the picture then the child should the, uh, the, the child should be actually rewarded for a positive uh, outcome the parents should not engage in negative comments discouraging comments and all and especially in the setting of fecal incontinence, incontinence and all and no accusatory tone should be given that will be actually counterproductive and to gauge the improvement in uh, the uh, toilet practices a stool diary can be advised which should conclude which should include the daily bowel movements the consistency of the stools regarding the fecal incontinence pain or discomfort that is experienced during defecation laxative dose etc so this is how toilet training should proceed it should be at, it should be started not less than it should be started only after two years of age i'd preferably between three to four months and it is always better to provide uh, to pursue a rule of one scheduled toilet sits will be useful and regarding the position etc the points which i mentioned earlier fallacy number four treating a child who has functional constipation by using fibers alone or increasing the fluid intake above normal to treat to treat child, childhood constipation let us see what is the scientific evidence regarding these things these two points have been very specifically studied and studies have proven that increasing dietary fiber intake increasing dietary fiber intake accompanied by extensive behavioral interventions like the toilet training etc does not increase bowel frequency or reduce the requirement of laxatives so all these are actually complementary rather than supplementary so everything should go hand in hand similarly uh, as a rule of thumb dietary fiber intake for a no for a child as a thumb rule age in year plus 5 grams per day that will give the uh, the actual requirement of fiber for a child so we can incorporate all the dietary items like the fruits one portion of this much fruits uh, one serving of 100 gram will be giving 2 to 3 gram fiber if you double the portion that will be providing double the fiber intake similarly the tuberous fruits uh, tuberous vegetables like carrot radish etc they can also they are also rich in fiber similar with the suggestive of fecal impaction why fecal disimpaction is important because once we disembark the fe uh, disembark the rectum and colon no residual hard fetal matter will be retained in the colon and rectum that will be helpful for the maintenance laxative therapy which will keep the bowel moving and empty so much so that the rectum will returns to its normal anatomical configuration and physiological function in terms of diameter and the tone which will facilitate in the proper execution of anorectal reflexes and the pelvic floor synergy which is very essential for the defecatory process to go in a uh, effortless manner so that is why fecal disimpaction is of importance how can we attain this fecal disimpaction there are several modalities oral route will be the most uh, simplest and easiest one because it will be a non-invasive one and it can be even practiced that uh, on a domiciliary basis need not be done at a uh, hospital require a hospital admit hospital admission then rectal enema may be advised as a supplementary measure if there is a hard fecal impaction etc if the oral measure overall oral route of disimpaction and rectal enema fails then only we need to resort to manual evacuation that too under anesthesia only having done a uh, fecal disimpaction the job is not over the child needs to be reviewed one week after disimpaction to assess for re-impaction because as i said in the pathophysiology this is a recurring process unless we break that chain 
unless we are doubly sure that disinfection has been done promptly, then only we should proceed with the maintenance therapy. Disinfection or clean out, how can we attain this disinfection or clean up? Polyethylene glycol will be a best agent for this uh, disinfection process. There are two molecules, polyethylene glycol weight 3350 and 4000. This basically the, refers to the molecular weight of the product. At home, the dose recommended is 1 to 1.5 gram per kg that you can give in two divided doses for three consecutive days and at a maximum you can stretch this up to six, day, six days even. If you are doing it in a hospital setting, you need to give as a, an infu you can give by nasogastric tube or as an oral as a liquid preparation at the rate of 25 ml per kg per hour in young children. What is the end point of disinfection? The effluent, the outcoming effluent should be clear. That is the end point. And young, ch young children may actually require intravenous fluid during the process to maintain hydration. Are there any side effects with this process? Uh, the children may at times, at times can have loose stools because of the purgative action, bloating, flatulence, and occasionally nausea and vomiting. And what are the rectal agents that are used for disinfection or clean out? Especially in a neonate and all, saline is recommended for a weight is actually weight based if it is less than 1 kg you can use 5 ml more than 1 kg 10 ml and uh, escalating doses depending upon the age then phosphate soda is another another pharma pharmacologic agent that can be used for disinfection that that is not recommended in infant that can be used in the age group 2 to 18 years the dose is like 2.5 ml per kg with a maximum of 133 ml per dose the maximum for three to six days. The protoclysis enema is the classical example of this phosphate soda preparation. And having attained the disinfection, we will move to maintenance therapy. What are the agents at our disposal? There are a multitude of pharmacological agents like lact lactulose and lactitol, milk of magnesia, which is essentially the magnesium hydroxide preparation, liquid paraffin and all. This milk of magnesia, liquid paraffin, the taste is actually unpalatable and liquid paraffin actually if used in young children that carries the risk of lipoidal pneumonia in case of aspiration and all. And uh, the, since the last two decades there has been an increasing importance given for polyethylene glycol. It has in fact been a game changer in the laxative management of children coming with constipation. Let us see about polyethylene glycol in detail. For that, what is the importance of maintenance therapy? Just like disinfection, this, this itself has some guiding principles. This maintenance therapy ensures complete daily emptying of the lower bowel. It prevents the fecal incont incontinence and abdominal pain. And it has to be individualized and the dose has to be titrated to achieve at least uh, one or two bowel movements daily. The maintenance therapy Osmotic laxatives are the key. key. They are the mainstay of maintenance therapy in children. The basic mechanism of action is they imbibe water and make the stool softer and it will be easy to pass. Polyethylene glycol and lactulose or lactitol based preparations will be the preferred osmotic laxatives. Polyethylene glycol, it is actually, a, as the name indicates, it is actually an ethylene glycol with the so many hydroxyl chains added to the tune of 68 to 84 that will be adding to the variation in the molecular weight. This is essentially a non-toxic water soluble polymer which is hardly absorbed in the GI tract. If you administer orally around 96 percentage will be recovered in the fecal, face fecal and the rest will be excreted in urine and it is a biologically inert substance. It is neither metabolized by the colonic bacteria nor it influence the movement of other solutes as it carries no charge. The laxity effect of polyethylene glycol is not only by the osmotic effect, it has some intrinsic chemical properties. Upon interaction with water molecule, it alters the physical chemistry of the solution which leads to it will be sequestering more and more water. As we when we administer it orally, that will serve to increase the water content of stool and it will make softer and the passage will be effortless. The effect of uh, polyethylene glycol is dose dependent and uh, further the dose of the effect of uh, polyethylene glycol in terms of uh, stool bowel movements will be seen after 24 to 48 hours of giving medication. What are the PEC formulations available? As already mentioned there is a 3350 preparation that is available in powder formulation. 
then there is a polyethylene glycol with electrolyte com combination it, along with polyethylene glycol there, there is a concussion of sodium chloride potassium chloride sodium bicarbonate and sodium sulfate that is available as liquid preparation and now that they have come up with a newer liquid formulation the advantage of this is that for PEC 3350 we need to reconstitute and dilute it before dispensing whereas for the for 4000 molecular weight preparation that can no dilution is required and the taste is also pleasing because the low volume it may be of better use in pediatric population and as of now polyethylene glycol is the front line in the therapy of uh, functional constipation and it is more effective as compared to lactose or lactitol from india itself we have evidence based uh, we have a large sized studies which uh, recommend the efficacy of this preparation over lactose and lactose the standard maintenance dose is 0.5 to 1 gram it is a little bit different from the uh, disinfection dose which i mentioned earlier and it is recommended only in children more than 12 months of age the side effects also also already mentioned it is safe for both short term as well as long term use and moving to the other osmotic laxatives the other ones available in the market the common one is the lactulose it is also a non absorbable synthetic disaccharide basically it comprises of two molecules of galactose and fructose how does it act it undergo fermentation in the colon liberating short chain fatty acids carbon dioxide and hydrogen the dose is roughly 1 ml per kg and you can go up to 2 ml per kg always given as a bd dosage the side effects of lactose is abdominal discomfort and distension the other product in the disaccharide category which is also an osmotic laxative is lactitol it is an analog it is a monohydrate analog of lactulose it contains galactose and sorbitol in in difference from uh, is the, the composition is different from that of lactulose the dose is 250 to 400 mg per kg per day Lactitol, in comparison to lactose, it is more palatable. This is the paper which I was alluding to you, where the, this is a study from Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute in Lucknow, where they have compiled the clinical spectrum of uh, uh, children presenting with constipation with a large sample size of 316 cases. The important finding in their study was, in a developing country like India, functional constipation is the most common cause of constipation in children. Simple clinical parameters like uh, delayed passage of meconium, uh, presence of growth failure, absence of retentive posturing, absence of fecal impaction, all these point to an organic cause. It is a well-known fact. And the important finding last, what they have mentioned is that although PEG and lactose were uh, both equally effective, the requirement for switchover, that is uh, uh, because of either due to poor, effic poor effect or due to compliance issue, that switchover problem was very less compared for uh, polyethylene glycol in comparison to lactose. So to summarize, polyethylene glycol is the first line therapy for functional constipation in children. Under 12 months of age, the only recommended drug is lactose or lact lactitol. In case of non-response or intolerance due to non-palatability issue due to polyethylene glycol, etc., we can switch over to lactulose or lactitol. Further, two osmotic agents should not be given simultaneously during the management of functional constipation. Then there are some other category of uh, laxatives also, like the stimulant lax lax laxatives. What is their role in the management of functional constipation? It is used as a, only as a rescue therapy, not as a, on a long-term basis. The, by, by rescue therapy, what we mean is that a child who has been on maintenance therapy, say he or she is developing an acute or sudden episode of constipation while, compliant, while the child is regular compliant on maintenance therapy. In such cases, for two to three days, to tide over the acute episode of constipation, we can use stimulant laxative and then it has to be stopped. The, the prototype agents are bisacordyl, which has an oral preparation is there, and also rectal preparation. How does it act? It stimulates colonic motility, promotes secretion and inhibition of absorption of water and electrolytes. It has an oral effect within six to eight hours. It can be given as a single bedtime dose, 5 mg per day. For the age group 3 to 10 years and more than 10 years, you can give 5 to 10 milligram per day. It should not be used in children below 3 years of age. Rectal side effects, uh, this, uh, the, the, the rectal medication, the, the, effect, the, the effect is immediate within 30 to 60 minutes. The dose is in a 2 to 10 year old, 5 milligram supposedly will be in, in, enough. For a 10 year old child, doses up to 10 milligram per day may be required. 
The side effect is that it can cause abdominal cramps, diarrhea, hypokalemia, and proctitis. So in those children having proctitis, this is contraindicated. And on short-term use, side effects are very rarely seen. The other stimulant laxative which is uh, very widely used is the sodium picosulfate which is a very easily available as a liquid, liquid formulation. It exerts its action by virtue of its active metabolite that is produced by the bacteria which increases the gut mortality. It is given as an OD dose. It can be given in small infants. One month to four years of age, the dose will be like 2.5 to 10 mg per day. For older children, they can go up to 20 mg per day. The side effects will be like abdominal pain, nausea and diarrhea. And it is contraindicated in proctitis and abdominal distension with underlying intestinal obstruction or paralytic ileus. So, fallacy number seven, treating a child who has constipation with a laxative for duration of two weeks. This is also very commonly seen in practice. Children receiving only very short course treatment for 10 days, 15 days there and after that abruptly stopping, again coming with the recurrence of symptoms. So, what is the science on this aspect? Actually, long term maintenance is needed. Again, just if you, if you, if you recap the pathophysiology, that the, we need to continue the treatment that the child has to be symptom free while on maintenance therapy for at least six months before we contemplate tapering and that tapering has to be done on a very graded manner over a period of three months this is to prevent recurrence of symptom and the maintenance treatment should be gradually been rather than ab abruptly because we need to prevent relapse always emphasize on a treatment before contemplating on uh, withdrawing the medication so in practice one should follow up plan. Reduce the dose of laxatives only after a normal stool pattern. The stool pattern has become normal. A stool diary, which I mentioned earlier, is, is helpful to customize treatment that is take that will take care of the symptom as well as the laxative dose. There should not be an abrupt stoppage of medication. Always ensure that fecal impaction does not recur. Diet modification has to be continued along with pharmacotherapy, and toilet training should continue for two to three years after we start the treatment. And as far as review is concerned, initially, the initial initial uh, months of treatment, you can have a weekly review for two to three weeks, just to be sure that the disimpaction process, is, that the, the, the impaction process is not recurring and the maintenance is proceeding in a smooth way and also to ensure that the children are compliant with the medication. Then you can have a monthly follow-up till the stooling is normal and finally monthly on a follow-up. So, Having seen the management, at what point of time we should think about uh, uh, work up for additional etiology or reference, etc. If a child who is diagnosed as functional constipation and has been on optimal medication, optimal conventional treatment in the, with, with the protocol which I mentioned earlier for at least two months, despite compliance, you are not having the desired response, then we need to think about other causes and probably we may contemplate reference. So what are the key lessons as far as this particular this very common problem is concerned is functional constipation is a very common healthcare issue in children. Most of them require only a very good clinical history and examination. Investigations are very rarely required as a routine for diagnosing functional constipation. No weight and approach should be adopted in functional constipation because that will be resulting in perpetuation of the stool with withholding maneuver. Educate on the role of toilet training, emphasizing on the various aspects like when to start, how to be done uh, regarding the reward process, then the actual uh, toilet position, etc. All these have to be has to be emphasized during the beginning of treatment itself. You should take the family into confidence. Diet alone as a treatment modality is not the key for successful management in outcome and always assess the need for, for disimpaction before putting the child on laxative medication in the first go and continue laxative. Peg is the upfront choice for a minimum of six to nine months before you think about withdrawing and tapering the medic tapering and stopping the medications ultimately. Thank you very much. Thank you Prashant for that uh uh, informative and uh, simple talk. I think most of the questions regarding uh, constipation uh, has been answered. Uh, while we wait for uh, more questions to come from the audience, uh, I'm giving a few minutes to our uh, official sponsor.
Mr. Sujit of the Unique Pharma. Please, Sujit. Yes, yes, Dr. Riyas. Thank you so much. And on the behalf of Unique, uh, I would like to thank uh, Trivendam IIP for giving us platform to showcase and launch the brand uh, in the treatment of or management of functional constipation. So I would like to showcase and introduce the brand to all the audience uh, present here uh, on this platform organized by IIP Trivendram. So uh, I would request Dr. Prashant, can you just stop your share so that I can uh, share my slides? <laughs> Dr. Prashant, can you stop share so that I can share? Thank you so much, sir. So as Dr. Prashant has highlighted uh, that a patient of a child of functional constipation always have a phenomena of withholding the withholding the stool. So uh, not able to go, to, uh, not avoiding to go to a toilet. So we have displayed here uh, the example and the expression of a child who is suffering from the fun functional constipation. So what I'm saying is when child goes to the toilet, he says, uh, I am done. But it's not done because impaction is impacting. So that uh, that actually Dr. Prashant has highlighted beautifully in his presentation. So to uh, have disimpaction from impaction, we are uh, introducing a polythene glycol 4000. Polythene glycol 4000 as it has been approved uh, by societies like Dispagan, Napsagan, and IAP for treatment of functional constipation in the child about the more than six months. So for the glycol 4000, Dr. Prashant has already highlighted in detail. I'll just uh, brush up a few uh, uh, efficacy points for the glycol 4000. For the glycol 4000 improves colonic transit and stool frequency. For the glycol 4000 has impact, high resolution of impaction. And for the glycol 4000 improves fecal consistency and increases stool water output. So we're introducing a brand on this platform to all of you is the brand name of our Pothing Glycol 4000 is Laxolite. The Laxolite brand, again, easy to remember and easy to write. It's basically a laxative, clear laxative for clear action and it's light on bowel. So Laxolite is colorless liquid, odorless and ready to use, no dilution required. So Laxolite is available in two packs. It is available in 200 ml pack and 100 ml pack to have to, to suit your need of giving the dose for disimpaction as well as maintenance therapy. So each 25 ml of Laxolite contains polythene glycol 4,010 gram. Again, it's it's uh, kind of 10 gram is ideal. Can we can increase the dose from the 10 gram or taper the dose? So again, this this has gives you flexibility to either increase or re, uh, reduce the dose in uh, managing functional constipation in the children. Laxolite is sugar free. Devoid of uh, electrolytes like sodium free, water soluble, colorless liquid, and it is available in 100 ml pack and 200 ml pack. The laxolite uh, highlights were highlighted. This I'll just uh, rush through it. Laxolite, which contains uh, uh, polythene glycol 4000, it is a liquid formulation with a better test. Uh, so, acceptance from the pediatric patient is better. Uh, laxolite is sugar free, sodium free. A ready to use liquid can be mixed with any beverage like water, milk, and fruit juice. So, a uh, child can take it easily. And uh, laxolite has a few side effects and approved from six months of age, which is based on extensive clinical data, clinical trials done on this molecule. So, laxolite, as I highlighted before, approved by IAP, Spagan, and Napsagan, and available globally in more than 23 countries. So Laxolite is, uh, is a uh, second brand of uh, polythene glycol 4000, which is superior than P3350. As uh, studies highlighted, PG3350 or a long term use can lead to electrolyte loss. But whereas uh, PG4000 does not lead to electrolyte loss, PG4000 in Laxolite is ready to use. So no dilution required. But PG3350 available in two forms I one a powder form and a liquid form. So both the forms, a dilution is required and in a dose of disimpaction dilution required up to 100 ml so volume of distribution is very high to take to the child so that in that sense laxolite provides you convenience and ease of administration to the child suffering from 
constipation. So laxonide again has a natural taste, whereas PG3350, when you add electrolytes along with that, it gives a salty taste or an oxidic feeling. So sometimes uh, the uh, patient compliance can be an issue with this formulation. So laxonide can be mixed with any beverages, whereas PG3350 can be diluted with water only. So laxolite, again, uh, Dr. Prashad already has highlighted the dose. Dose for disimpaction is 1 to 1.5 gram per kg per day for initial 3 to 6 days. And for the maintenance therapy, 0.3 to 0.7 gram per kg per day. To suit these needs of disimpaction and maintenance therapy, laxolite comes with you, comes uh, with two packs, 100 ml pack and 200 ml pack, which is colorless, uh, no dilution required, odorless, so I'm sure laxolite will be a, a choice of drug, drug of choice while managing constipation in your patients. So I would request uh, all the audience to use laxolite in your clinical practice while managing the functional constipation. And again, I would I'd like to thank IIP Trivandrum for giving us a platform to launch laxolite. And, uh, and I would like to have a big thank you for Dr. Prashant giving us detailed and a simpler presentation from the diagnosis point of view and a management point of view. Thank you so much, sir, for giving us an idea about the constipation and the uh, treatment approach. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity. Now it's over to Dr. Riaz and Dr. Prashant for the question answers. Thank you, Mr. Sujit. Uh, now I will take the questions. Uh, the first question is uh, regarding uh, treatment of um, constipation in an infant uh, there are a few connected questions i think prashant can answer all together that is um, it's uh, a baby who had not passed tools for how many days we should consider it as constipation and what are the uh, choices for laxatives in a, uh, an infant prashant audible now Yes, 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 audible, audible. audible. Uh, that, that is what I am actually going to say. That is what I was emphasizing during the talk. Actually, we should not be guided by the Bowen frequency alone. Sometimes uh, for a child, they may be happy with, if there is bowel movement once in two days, three days, etc. like that. Along with that, we need to consider the other associated symptoms like abdominal distension, vomiting, etc. Only then I think uh, is warranted to intervene. Otherwise, sometimes it may be normal just because the baby has not passed the stool for uh, uh, five days, six days, etc. is not actually a very something. And if you really want to use a laxative, this uh, lactose is very recommended one. And if you are suspect, if you are suspecting some uh, uh, impaction, etc. and all, this alanolima can be tried. Yes. Bashand, is there a lower age limit for the use of uh, lactulose or lactitol? No, 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 no. You can use in infants and all. Any age group, you can use. And um, uh, uh, also can, be, uh, can you compare sodium picosulfate and uh, uh, lactulose lactitol group? Uh, which is better or when to switch from one to the another? Uh, Actually, actually, the, both act by different mechanism of action. This lactose is basically an osmotic, la osmotic, la osmotic laxative. Uh, for maintenance therapy, we prefer the osmotic laxative. The role of stimulant laxative is like the child has been on maintenance therapy for quite some time and has been regular compliant, etc. And at times, due to some unexplained reasons or so, the child has developed acute retention. Then in that scenario, we can use the stimulant laxative, not on a long-term basis. There, there, there is the role of the sodium picosulfate, etc. And um, uh, even though we say that uh, we don't count the number of days, uh, when the neonate does not uh, pass tools for uh, five to six days, the parents get worried. So uh, uh, how can we reassure them? Uh, when we should worry and uh, uh, when we can take it as normal. Suppose there are no feeding issues and there are no other features of intestinal obstruction like abdomen distension, vomiting, etc., then we can be rest assured. We need not go in for uh, other detailed investigations like uh, radio exposure, etc., to consult them. Uh, any role of neotomic enema in infants? Neotomic, neotomic enema, I have not heard. I don't know the farm. I don't know the composition. 
Okay. Uh, Dr. Prasad, I say neotomic enema is nothing but sodium chloride. Uh -huh. Sodium chloride solution you will get it as in enema. Saline. Yes, yes, same. Okay. Sodium chloride is approved. Saline we can use. Okay. Saline can be used. Good to see you, ma'am. About flavoring. Yes, and uh, treatment for anal fissure. Treatment for anal fissure. Local treatment. Treatment, you can use a lignocaine jelly just to ameliorate the pain and all. That is actually sufficient. You don't go for the combination preparation that is used in adult treatment. Yes, see that. A lot of other components like nifidipine, etc. and all. That is actually not really required. You can use a plain lignocaine jelly. That is that is easy. No, I'm not doing that. Yeah, apply it. Okay, and then uh, any role of um, macro gold? What is a macro gold in uh, treatment of uh, macro gold? Is just the polyethylene glycol, it's just another name only. Okay, okay, macro gold is the same as polyethylene glycol, it's another, another plain name only. Thank you, Prashant. I think uh, even though we had uh, exceeded our time limits, we still have around 100 uh, participants. Thank you for the nice meeting. And uh, once again, congrats to Benar Sarantia for uh, holding this session every week. Now, Tuesdays, we all wait for the uh, academic session from IAC Trivandrum. Thank you. Thank you. I'm ending the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.